could could you talk a little bit about the electric ele electret microphone? Electric microphone, sure. Of course, um, could you like talk about the word electret because that's not a very familiar word for most people. It wasn't familiar with me either <laughs> when I got started uh, there. Um, um, I think the best analogy for um, an electret is permanent magnet. Mm -hmm. you, have, you have a magnet, and if you have a ferromagnetic material and that comes close to or near the magnet, there is an influence. There, there's actually work that's being done uh, mm -hmm. by the either attraction or, or repulsion uh, from the magnet. Uh, what my colleague Gerhard Sessler and I were able to do was to essentially make an electrical analog of a permanent magnet. Cool. Okay, in other words, now, now you have to be careful here because uh, to say that is easy, but mm -hmm. to fully explain and, and, and quantify the differences is not so easy. Uh, Electromagnetism, you can do work. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, electric motors and so forth uh, can, can um, uh, generate quite a bit of energy. Unfortunately, so far, the, the, the uh, electrical analog can only do a very little work, but that little work is important in many, in, in many respects. In the microphone, condenser microphones existed, in, in fact, they were invented at Bell Labs by E.C. Wente mm -hmm. as a replacement for the carbon microphone. Mm -hmm. but the condenser microphone required a very large DC bias, a few hundred volts were, mm -hmm. were, were necessary. And uh, this is because you want a, an output voltage that's proportional to the change in pressure on, on the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and um, uh, this large voltage made it pretty impractical from the standpoint of a telephone. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so what we were able to do was to replace that battery with a very thin piece of, of, of polymer, mm -hmm. which we had properly treated to embed charges in that polymer so that they couldn't escape. Mm -hmm. And so it's the feel that's generated from the electret that replaces the need for the battery, which reduces the complication of, of the uh, electret of the condenser microphone mm -hmm. and made it useful in telecommunications. You've got one on that thing. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're basically 95 to 98 percent of all microphones made in the world today are based on the principles that Sessler and I taught. So cool. it's taken over everything, including out of space. <laughs> so, so what's that like to see uh, that, that invention everywhere? Um, I, uh, I'm still on, on, a, on a high cloud. Um, mm -hmm. Um, um, and, and I really try very hard not to let it uh, uh, swell my head so that I can't get through doors. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I think to, to a large extent I've uh, uh, succeeded there um, to uh, uh, receive the awards that I, uh, that I have, including the National Medal of Technology, are just unbelievable of uh, what uh, what that does for one's um, uh, ego, um, mm -hmm. and 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 to know that uh, that um, well that I've made life a little bit easier and, and a little bit better for a whole lot of people is uh, really uh, grat gratification that is hard to put in words. So. Um what kind of projects are you working on now, and what kind of research are you doing, or would you have to kill me? <laughs> well, um, you know, um, the lifespan of technology is, is, is very short these days. Uh, when's the last time you bought a CD, right, mm -hmm. versus 10 years ago? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, I mean, CDs are still around, but they're better in uh, methods of doing it. Um, maybe not better, but different. Yeah. <coughs> um, uh, the electret microphone, the first commercial electret microphone was in 1968, mm -hmm. and it's still a preferred microphone. Mm -hmm. 
um, at some point it's going to be replaced. And so one of my projects here is to uh, see if I can't come up uh, with a replacement for the electric microphone. And one of my graduate students, uh, Danielle Farrar, is, uh, is heading uh, that project. And what we're trying to do is um, uh, piezoelectricity is, is, is again a, a very interesting phenomenon and, and most people are familiar with it if you have a, a gas stove and you turn it on you hear something go click 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 and then poof and yeah. suddenly you get a flame. Well what's happening is that there's a hammer that's tapping on a piece of piezoelectric material and it taps on it until it generates a spark, right? Mm -hmm. This is how much energy uh, these things can, uh, can, electrical energy these things can, can uh, produce. Uh, that's well and good. So there's a lot of energy there, but it's not compatible with many things that we want to do. And so what Danielle is doing is trying to, to synthesize new materials, mm -hmm. to take a, 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 um, uh, a material that has a large dipole moment, mm -hmm. uh, usually very, very small, uh, not quite in the nano region, but approaching that, and now embed this in this dipole in another material that we can control the, the, the mechanical properties of, right? Hmm. And so if we can do that, then uh, it, it would be possible to, uh, to make a much better and, and even potentially less expensive microphone than, than the current electret. Okay. So that's one uh, project. The, the, another project that, uh, that I'm working on, and Helen Barnhill, another graduate student, is supporting me on, on this, and that is um, that the hospital environment is extremely noisy. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's complained about and then complained about and talked about since Florence Nightingale, really. Yeah. But very little has been done about it. Uh, in most enclosures, you can put a carpet on the floor, you can put an acoustic ceiling up, but in hospitals you can't do either of those mm -hmm. because you have to scrub the floors and wash the walls and, and concerning about bacterial contamination. Yeah, yeah. And so they can't use traditional methods to quiet hospitals. And so we're looking into what turns out to be very simple, but and sometimes you say, well, why in the heck didn't somebody think about this before? But uh, Eileen Bush Vishniak and I, um, when she was uh, here, uh, we worked together and um, we asked ourselves one day, and this is a Weinman, Weinman lab and where we have a makeshift uh, anechoic chamber and it's just, we went out to the hardware store and bought two inch thick fiberglass backed by aluminum, wrapped it in muslin to keep it from dripping down your, your neck and put it up around uh, on all of the walls and so forth. And so we said, you know, gee, was garbage bags are washable. What happens to the acoustical performance of, of this fiberglass if we put it in a garbage bag? <laughs> real simple, you know. Yeah, science, something else on top of it, yeah. Right. Turns out it works well. That the that the sound waves for the most part don't see the garbage bag. Mm -hmm. Now, of course. Nobody's going to let you put a garbage bag up on the wall or mm -hmm. on the ceiling. So we had to find materials that were accepted in acceptable in hospitals to cover the the fiberglass. And we have a project in in uh, in um, Weinberg at the Medical Institute where we're working now on on uh, putting up. Uh, fiberglass has been covered with some other materials uh, yeah. but that are washable and uh, and this is uh, extremely successful in going.